The founder and CEO of Bumble has made matchmaking her business. She was one of the co-founders of Tinder in 2012. After co-founding Tinder, she left and brought a sexual harassment suit against the company. She faced backlash online that made her question what she should do next. She set out to create a woman-only app that could be, placed, could be a place where users could exchange compliments with each other, no negativity or bullying allowed. Her Bumble dating app is 20 million users strong and is well known for its feminist approach to the online courting process. When two heterosexual users are matched, a connection can only be made if the woman makes the first move. The company expanded its reach last year with the launch of Bumble BFF and last month with, with Bumble Biz, which aims to make networking as simple as swiping right. Please welcome Whitney Wolf Hurd with Fortune's Kristen Bellstrom. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Whitney. Thank you for having me. Uh, so as the co-founder of Tinder and now the founder of Bumble, you have probably done more to change the way we date than any woman in America. <laughs> and I am curious to see how far that influence has made it into this room. So could you guys put your hand up for me if you have ever used a dating app? Come on, don't be shy, I did. OK. And do we have any Bumble users in the room? OK, a couple. So My mom raised her hand. <laughs> <laughs> you have a plan, an audience plan. Um, so for those people who didn't put their hands up, tell us what is different about Bumble. Sure. So there's no doubt that all of us, whether or not you raised your hand or not, we need connections in our life. And I think each and every woman in this room can relate to the pain points of dating at one point or another, no matter who you dated, um, be it men, women, otherwise. Dating and relationships are a very profound part of who we are. And it's important that they start in an empowered way. And it's important that they are rooted in good behavior and in kindness and in positive interaction. And it's so, it's so frequent that, that it's not. Um, the way we treat one another can completely impact the course of our lives. And if you have a bad relationship at home, that bleeds into your work life, that bleeds into your friendships, that bleeds it over into your health. Um, and so what we wanted to do with Bumble was to really create a place where we could meet in, in, in an empowered way and encourage good, kind, positive behavior and really reconfigure these gender norms that are so broken in our society and have, have become pervasive in, in how we connect. So in a practical way, how does that play out on the app? Sure. So when a woman and a man connect on Bumble, contrary to most dating norms, um, walking into a bar or meeting in a coffee shop or what you've ever seen in a Disney movie, women make the first mm -hmm. move. And this is counterintuitive to what we've all been raised to believe. We've all been raised to believe that men call the shots, men make the first move. We should not only not go first, but when a man goes first, we should run away. We should play hard to get. Mm. And so something really fascinating takes place when you raise an entire world. It's not exclusive to America. It's not exclusive to one age group. But what happens when you introduce a profile into that equation becomes quite scary. So when you, when you encourage men to be macho, aggressive, go after the woman, and you tell the women, don't react, run away, play hard to get, reject them, this leads to aggressive behavior. And this leads to um, very negative interaction. And so we wanted to really reconfigure that. OK. Uh, and I want to ask you where that idea came from, the idea of creating an app that would really structurally change the way we engage with each other online. Um, and as you, Lee talked a little bit about this in the introduction, um, but you may remember that Whitney sued Tinder um, for sexual harassment discrimination. They settled that suit. She can't talk about that. 
but there was a lot of media coverage uh, around it, including a leak of some very personal text messages, which generated a lot of chatter, some of it pretty vicious, honestly. Um, what was it like to go through that? You were very young also at the time. So I'm not going to comment on any, any part of the lawsuit. However, what followed in terms of the reaction from complete strangers to journalists to people that I actually knew through a friend of a friend of a friend, it was extremely invasive. And all of a sudden, overnight, I went from being a 24-year-old girl who was just like any other young professional, sure, my first real technical job ended up being this incredibly fast-growing, exciting company. But that didn't mean I was setting out to become famous or have a well-known name in any capacity. I was just doing my job, and I was working hard. And to go from being a 24-year-old girl, woman, young woman, to this character online, um, it exposed me to something that I would never realize a, existed, or B, would change the course of my life in the sense that I was completely attacked digitally. Um, I would open Twitter, and I would have anything ranging from death threats to the most aggressive, nasty words, and I took them as gospel. I took them so personally, and I let them completely destroy me. Um, there were days where I refused to get out of bed. I didn't want to go anywhere. I think it was two years before I actually went to socialize again. I, wow. I didn't want to do anything. And this moment kind of occurred in me where I realized, even in this dark moment where I feel worthless, I feel low, I feel that I'm at the end, um, I was inspired to do something about it. And what I realized was we're living in this digital moment, this digital age where everything takes place online. But it's negative, it's bad, it's dark. And I wanted to reconfigure it to be bright and kind and compassionate. And so that's when I was going to um, start an app that was going to be called Mercy, and it was going to be a female-only compliment network, um, social network of just complimentary behavior. And the idea was that compliments are contagious. That's scientifically proven. And instead of spreading nasty behavior and insults, let's spread contagious good behavior. And it was right around that time that my now business partner, he um, is the founder and CEO of the world's largest dating platform called Badoo. He reached out to me and um, I had met him previously the year before and he said, what are you going to do? And I told him my vision. and. He said, that's really amazing, but if you want to make a huge impact, do this in dating. And I thought he was crazy. I mean, are you kidding? <laughs> Why would I ever go back into dating Another after all dating this? Half, no yeah. way. Um, but he was right, and fundamentally, dating was broken. Not, not even referring to that in a digital capacity. It's, it's inherently broken. And, um, and so we kind of sat down and said, OK, well, how can we do something in the vein of Merci, where I'm passionate and it's, it's progressive, but in the dating space. And I had to look at what, what, was, what, what problem do I want to solve for me, for my friends, for my little sister? And it was that I could never send the first text. I could never message the guy first, ever. I mean, how many of you have agonized over, should I text him? No, no, you can't. You have to wait two days, or three days, or another hour. Should I add another Y to the end of hey, or an exclamation point? <laughs> What's going to happen if I do or don't do that? I mean, come on. We agonize over these things. And I, I was sick of it. I yeah. was sick and tired of it. And there you go. That was the moment that I said, I think I've got it. Women are going to make the first move. Um, I have another question for Whitney, but I'm going to come to you guys after this, so think about your questions. Um, so that clearly touched a nerve. Mm -hmm. You've had more than 20 million downloads. 24 million registrations. Okay. Sorry. And to... you just told me that users spend an average of 90 minutes on the app a day. Um, but now you've decided uh, that you're going to expand that, and you're offering a new service called Bumble Biz, which is a networking service. So why now with Bumble Biz? That's right. So we are about to approach our three-year mark. Actually, our amazing head of brand is here. If anyone follows us, follows us on Instagram, she's like the voice of Bumble. She's in the front row. Sorry to embarrass you, Alex. Um, and she actually said something really profound on the way out here. She said, we've done three verticals in three years. And so we launched as a dating app. And a lot of you are probably saying, well, I'm not single, or I would never use a dating app. And 
that's exactly why we evolved. We then launched a friend finding vertical, Bumble BFF, and now we've most recently launched Bumble Biz, which is a way for you to network in an empowered way, to make connections without being solicited. Um, like, so women still have to yes, be the first Yes, women make the first move on, on Bumble Biz as well. And just to clarify, Bumble is now the umbrella brand. Mm. And in the same app, we have these three different verticals. So now Bumble is your ultimate social network for people you don't know yet. This is a place for you to, you know, okay, I have to do a little marketing plug, but build your hive. Um, and and so now that that is exactly why we did that. And so you know, kind of our tagline now is um, career advancements without the unwanted advances. Hmm. That's very timely right now. Uh, do we have any questions in the audience? Anyone? Anyone? Oh, we got one over here. Hi, I'm, say I'm, your name. <laughs> sure. Hi, I'm Melody from Fox. Okay. Um, I was really interested in your comment about um, like really hitting a structural issue and some of the, the practices that you are observing. I wonder how you think about the practice of ghosting now, and that I, that seems um, like a new it's a, a new behavior that I don't know what, what led to it, but is it something that you think can be structurally addressed? So, great question. Had somebody told me a few years ago that I'd spend half my day thinking about ghosting, <laughs> I would not have known what to tell you. But this is a huge issue. And Bumble was founded with you know, a few very key, um, key, key purposes. And one of those is accountability and driving online accountability, both you know, on the platform and then being accountable for that behavior offline as well. And so this is a huge focus of ours right now. How can we, through not just marketing, not just branding, not just our interaction with users, um, you know, kind of in our community, but how can we actually engineer anti-ghosting tactics into our product? And we just had a several-day meeting about ghosting, True Life 2017. <laughs> Um, and we have a lot of really exciting product features coming up in 2018 that are going to really try to combat that, and it all comes down to one thing, and that is accountability, holding people accountable for their behavior. Um, I, have, well, I have another question about um, Bumble Biz, because I downloaded it. I downloaded Bumble to play around with it, mm -hmm. um, and I made sure to tell my husband just casually, like, oh, I downloaded Bumble, but it's for work. <laughs> um, <laughs> So are you worried about putting dating and networking on the same platform is going to make some people uncomfortable? No, and the way we look at that is, would a bar shut down because it was only there for first dates or if it was there just to accommodate networking? I mean, there's a wedding going on somewhere in this building and we're at a networking event. That's life. Life is about the connections that we have. And why would we drive those even further apart when all of our connections should be rooted in kindness, accountability, respect, empowerment? How can we build all of that under one roof? And we are doing things from a product perspective. Actually, I think in a week from now, it becomes live. We can actually hide the dating vertical out of the app, and we'll timestamp it. Again, accountability. So I'm married. Um, I'll be able to actually just go ahead and quickly tap a little X. It will hide the dating vertical, and it will say the date that it was hidden. We're holding people accountable, not just in the way they treat one, one another on, on, on our platform, but in their own, in their own lives with their, their pre-existing relationships. Hmm. We have time for one more question for Whitney if we've got another one, or if not, I have one. Anyone see? Up. Oh, yep. Hi. Um, did you ever find that people didn't believe in your mission of adding a layer of friction in community building inside your app? Um, I find it's really important to make intentional, meaningful relationships. I was wondering if you had any uphill battles with that. 99% of it was an uphill battle. Okay. Uh, very few people early on believed in this, this mission. Um, it's interesting, two of my biggest supporters were men, my business partner and my now husband. And then of course my core early team, my family. Outside of that, I was a crazy person. Um, according to the internet, um, according to most people I went to school with, um, that's good and that's healthy. If people are telling you that they don't believe in what you're doing, it means you're doing something out of their comfort zone. And generally, people don't want to be taken out of their comfort zone because it's outside of the status quo. And if you're doing anything disruptive, and if you know it to be good and true and progressive, 
let the naysayers fuel you to work harder and to go faster and to sleep less. <laughs> well, take care of yourself, but you know what I mean. Um, I, I think that it's actually a really good sign if people are telling you it's not going to work because it means that it's something new, unique, and interesting. Um, you have access, I'm sure, to a lot of data. Uh, what is one really surprising thing you've learned about how people are dating now? I have been completely, my life has turned upside down when I've heard how many men say thank you so much. You cannot imagine how many men out there are very shy and they act macho or they put on a front that they're so in control and they're so powerful. Quite frankly, they're just scared because they have spent their entire life being rejected. Um, and again, no excuse for bad behavior. I'm the first to tell you that. But it's really fascinating to see how this makes it better for everyone. This is not just girl power. This is not just putting women in control. This is counterbalancing the, the, the gender scale. Hmm. And if you look at where we've placed men to be you know, ultra macho, ultra aggressive, and we've told women to be ultra submissive, when you say women make the first move and men can't, it just does this a little bit. And it's been really fascinating to see the results of, of that. I'm sure it's a moment of relief for some men who are like, oh, OK, fine. I'm just going to see who reaches out to me. Yeah, and, and it's not a laziness factor mm. either. I mean, this is one of those things where it's finally women get to call the shots. And I don't know if any of you ever had a dance in high school where the women asked. It was like a Sadie Hawkins, Sadie Hawkins. or winter, winter formal. Ours was called something different. But I always remember being in high school and saying to my mom, who's here, I really like this dance because like, I'm in control and I don't feel insecure and I feel like it's going to be on my own terms tonight. And so we built kind of this digital Sadie Hawkins dance to empower people to um, feel in control every day, all day. Yeah. Um, OK, one more quick business question before we go. Uh, there were reports this summer that you guys got a acquisition offer, $450 million, reportedly, and you turned it down. Can you tell us anything about that? No comment on that. Okay. I will say that we are growing very rapidly. Um, we are just getting started. Well, let me and ask that's you. That's my only comment. If the offer, if if you got the perfect offer, would you consider selling the company? Selling or not selling, it's not really the question. I don't go to work every morning for some number in the sky. I go to work for myself at 21 years old, for my little sister, for the future, for my maybe daughter one day if I'm fortunate to have one. I think that any smart and true businesswoman in this room and outside of this room knows that money is not the number one thing. And if you do something that's purposeful and passion and you're passionate, you're doing something to actually make the world a better place, the money will follow. All right. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you.